Mary, you may be seated. Welcome here to service at Captain United Methodist Church, whether you're joining us online or in person. It is a joy to be here with you. I'm Pastor David Benson, and it is always my honor when I am blessed to be here to preach. Appropriately, after we begin with our opening hymns, we jump right into service with our congregational prayer, which is our, our church prayer. Uh, we start off every service with this to get our hearts and our minds in the right place, in the right frame of mind, and to lift up to the Lord all of those wonderful blessings and joys He's given us, and also hold up to the many concerns that we hold in our world. There are indeed a few things that have uh, come across that uh, we are going to be in prayer for today. We've been in prayer for our world quite a bit lately, and we will continue to pray for our world, not just what's going on in Ukraine or in the world, but also what's going on in our nation. We hold all of those difficulties and all those tensions up to the Lord, and we remember that He's in control. He is good, He is holy, He is just, and He is in control. We also continue to pray for the greater United Methodist Church and this a coming church split, a denominational split. We pray for unity, for hope, for perseverance, both for the global United Methodist Church and also for us here in our corner of Dodge County. Here individually in our community, there are a few things that we are going to hold in our prayers. Uh, if you are on our prayer team, by the way, if you're not on our prayer team, email the office or email Don Bovey or email me, and we will make sure that you get put on the prayer team so you can be impressed with what happens between Sunday to Sunday. Uh, but there were several things that uh, were pretty serious this last week. Uh, Richard Montfort passed away this last week. His funeral will be on Tuesday, so we do hold the entire Montfort family in our prayers. Uh, Phil Du Bois uh, had many ups and downs this last week, but the last text message I got, which was yesterday from Sandy, uh, said that they are doing better. They're, they're still in ICU, Phil is still in critical condition, but he did, he did manage to get a smile and a wink the other day, which uh, is, is incredibly encouraging. But we continue to be in prayer for Phil. Many of you know Patty Hendrickson. Patty played the uh, piano here for a number of years. He's been a member for a long time before moving down to Brownsville. Uh, he's in St. Mary's with kidney failure and is uh, requesting prayers. Uh, and, and from what I've heard, uh, he's in excellent spirits. Uh, I'm hoping to go visit her this week, but uh, it, it sounds like he is, he is holding her own. Uh, Mentally and spiritually, but uh, many prayers for her physically. Also, continued prayers for the Nervies. Uh, that's uh, a couple of friends of me and Rihanna who had uh, their little girl last week. She was born with uh, diabetic hernia. They're still waiting to do the surgery on her. Her name's Corrine because she had an E. coli infection immediately after birth. Um, she is doing better by the sounds of it. The doctors are very optimistic, but it's incredibly scary, of course. Finally, uh, unfortunately, we're going to be praying for our churches this morning, for uh, Catherine and Pleasant Corners and other Baptist churches. Over the next couple of months, we are going to be spending a lot of time in the Book of Acts, which deals a lot with the early church, church growth, spreading across the world. And so it's appropriate for us to be in prayer for our individual churches that we would be beholden to the Lord, that we would be growing both spiritually ourselves here and also reaching out into the world and growing in that way as well. Those are the prayers that I have for us, beloved. What else do we need to be in prayer for this morning? Lisa? Thanks, Bethany, for the fan, you huh? Well, somebody remind me of the service. We'll sing you happy birthday. You're not getting out of it. Uh, but congratulations. And uh, what a job by the Lisa for surviving for 10 years. Uh, 
we will do it in prayer for you, Pat, as you just said. It's that city of Stone and Moon. Uh, and we will also take your husband in, uh, in our prayers. He's going to do a wonderful job taking care of you. I have no doubt. Why don't you have people ask him that? Maybe he wants to know Randy better than me. But I'm going to pray for you, Pat, as you go on. You will certainly keep your brother in law, and it's right with the team, right? Okay, not right with the team, right with the team. Okay, I don't think you're just going to do it right. I, I so often get that wrong. Perfect, thank you. We will continue to pray for your brother-in-law, Greg, as uh, he continues to go to chemotherapy for his prostate cancer. Uh, first, those PSA numbers will go down, and that then is less than the dose. Uh, hello? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. And we again thank you, Lord, for allowing us to gather here together and worship with you. Lord, you are good and just and holy. We know that you hear our prayers. We know that you care for us and for this world. And so, Lord, we lay at your feet everything that is on our hearts and minds today. Heavenly Father, we continue to pray for our world. We pray for those who are suffering in Ukraine. We pray for an end to that conflict. We pray for all those who are suffering the world over from everything from world hunger to war, all the tensions that abound. We pray that you would bring about an end to those struggles and those difficulties. We pray as well for our nation, for an end to the tensions here, for safety and for peace. Lord, we should be watching over the United States of America as only we can. We also continue to pray for the greater United Methodist Church. And as all of us come to the big decision down the line. Heavenly Father, we pray for unity, we pray for peace, we pray that your will will be done in our congregation here locally as well as globally. Lord, we you hear our prayer. We pray, Father, for many who are in the hospital and many of those who are sick. We pray, Father, that you be giving peace and hope to the Marquardt family this morning, that uh, as we remember Richard on Tuesday, that you be giving peace as only you can to Jill and to the whole family. We pray for peace as well for Phil and the whole boys' plan. Lord, thank you for how you have walked over and blessed Phil, for how you've given him and his folks strength. Thank you, Father, for so part in all of us. We pray that you would be healed and be able to come home soon. We pray the same for Connie. Thank you, Father, for her marvelous spirit in this. We pray that you would be giving her peace and healing according, in accordance with your will with regard, with regard to your kidneys. Lord, would you watch over her children as well as they come to take care of them. We pray, Father, for the nervy, for middle Corrine, who is going to have back in her attorney surgery soon. We pray that she would be well, that she would be uh, healed of her E. coli infection, and that she would be able to come home with her folks very soon. Pray for Pat as she goes in for kidney stone removal. We pray that the, the surgery would go well, that it would be good, that it would be relatively seamless. Pray for Greg as he goes through chemotherapy, and we pray that his PSA would not climb, but it would lower. Lord, would you watch over him and his wife and his family as they deal with his prostate cancer? Heavenly Father, we also lift up a major joy to you today for the family's first birthday. Thank you, Father, for the wonderful joy of life, for the wonderful joy of seeing our little ones grow, and young men and women. Lord, would you continue to watch over the family? Thank you for him. Thank you for the blessing of this young fellow. Finally, Father, we look up to our churches here. 
We look up to you back in front of the and the of the church. And Lord, we pray that we would be hearing your call, that we would be following your will, that you would grow us both internally and externally as you desire. Lord, we lift all of these things up to you. It's in your son, in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. In speaking of uh, little worms and uh, worms, I invite our children to come forward for today's for children's battle. Now, this is very important. It is a plan. Well, well, let me, let me explain. First and foremost, do you think I have anything to do with making this plant look nice? You're exactly correct. Who do you think loves the plant and gave it to you? Very good. Yes, the friend of my beautiful wife. Some of them have been so far better with plants and most things than me. Uh, she may watch this later, so hopefully that gives me some good husband points. Uh, but in talking about plants, how do you think one plant gets to be men? How does it grow? What does it start at, Laura? Start to see, right? Little, tiny, incredibly small, and then it'll grow into a plant, right? And there's something really fantastic about how a plant like this does it. Now, the thing is, if you look in here, do you see how there's several different little root clusters? Yeah, there's several different spots where things are growing in there. And it kind of looks, if you look really close, like this guy right here is doing something different than the rest of the plant. You know what he's doing? He's growing, but he's actually making a whole other plant. It's going to grow out. And what this plant does, I think it's a spider plant. Some gardener will correct me later. Is it a spider plant? Okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> but the way a spider plant grows, a new spider plant, is it makes a little plant and then it shifts it over off to the side of the pot and drops it off. You have a spider plant? Did my wife give you a spider plant? I can't remember. Uh -huh. But that's how it grows and it drops in the morning. And that one will grow big and then it'll drop in the morning. And it just keeps going and going and going. And whether we're talking about an oak tree dropping acorns, it turns from one tree over time into a forest, or a spider plant that goes from being one tiny plant in a pot to several hundred in our home. It's amazing how they grow. Now, what do plants need in order to grow? Water, sun, dirt, right? The food in the dirt. What's that? Worms? Well, they do need worms and dirt. You're correct. But if it has all of those things, it's going to grow. It will always grow. Now, when we talk about the church, there was a time, believe it or not, about 170 years ago, where there was no cast in the United States church. There was no church here. What do you think happened? It wasn't built, you're right. But how did it get built? Do you know, do you know what they did? People came, and they, they call it a church plant. They call it that. Folks came from the great state of Wisconsin. You're welcome, everyone out there. Missionaries came from Wisconsin, said, Pastor needs a Methodist church, and they planted one here. Several families came and started this church, and it grew, and it grew. And over time, it went from being just four families from Wisconsin to many families from Minnesota. Now, this is how the church has always grown. And I'm going to read to you just a couple of, couple of verses from Acts, because just like plants need water and dirt and food and sunlight, the church needs a couple of things to grow too. 
loving people for what grows the people. And so, thank you. Peter said to them, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for his forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children, and your young, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And in many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, He saved from his perverse generation. So then those who received his word were baptized, and that day they were added about 3,000 souls. And here's the important part. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to pray. There's four things that Acts does to church needs to grow. Scripture, coming to church together, which we are doing right now, taking communion together, which you guys all will do someday, good Lord of will. And finally, and this is the biggest one perhaps, prayer, talking together. So if we want to grow from just being a seed, one or two little ones into many hundreds, one of the things we need to do is pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to gather here together. We thank you, Lord, for the little ones you have blessed us with and the bigger ones who are still growing. Lord, we humbly ask that we, that you would be growing us, that we would be devoting ourselves to scripture, fellowship, to communion, and prayer. Lord, would you be watching over us and using us for your will and your glory. We thank you so much in Jesus' name that we pray. I invite you to join me as we continue in the service with the prayer of affirmation, which comes from First Timothy. The bold portion we will all read together. This is the truth. There is one God and there is one mediator, Christ Jesus, who came as a ransom for all, to whom we testify. This saying is pure and Continue to affirm what it is that we hold to, the faith that we believe in, with the apostles free, the basic tenets and truths of our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the constant pilot, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence shall come to judge the great and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the life. Amen. Our readings for today all come from the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the sixth book in the New Testament, and unlike the majority of the other books in the New Testament, it's a historical document. It details how the church goes from 12 disciples to many thousands. And it's rather appropriate for us to study this with where we are at in the life of our churches here. We're going to read through the first 14 verses of Acts 1. Get the section, move into Acts 2, where we talk about Pentecost, and we will see how the church grows, how the Lord waters it, and brings life to it. Beginning in Acts chapter 1, verse 1. In my former book, the Exodus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do in his feet. A day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented, him, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them 
for a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but work to the gifts of my father's house, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized his father, but the few days he will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then the brethren around him and asked him, Where are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times and days the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Algeria and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before the day of the house and the fire meeting from the sun. They were looking and coming up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Now, Gavin, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go in heaven. Then they went to return to Jerusalem from the hill of the Mount of Olives, about the fast they walked to the city. And when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying, and those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, John, son of Alphaeus, and Simon, son of and Judas, son of James, not to be confused with the Spirit. They had come together constantly in prayer, along with the men, women, and Mary, mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Now, skipping back to Acts 22, we see what happens when Pentecost comes. When the next Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly it sounded like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit in other them. Now they, they were standing in Jerusalem, God fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And then they heard this sound that Christ came together in the wilderness. Because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly in the most part, are there these who are speaking Galileans? Then I said that each of us hears them in our native language. Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus of Asia, Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans, and the we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? But somehow, the next one of them has said, is that too much light? Now, Peter at this point gets up to speak, and here he says, starting in verse 21, and everyone who comes in the name of the Lord will be saved. So we are going to ask this man, Jesus of Nazareth was a man who credited by God to you, of miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate crime and foreknowledge, and you, the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of us. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and and the fire. And then the people heard this, they were put to their heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far out, for all whom the Lord our God will come. And with many other words he warned them and pleaded with them, Save yourself from this great generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. They found property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Here ends the scripture readings this morning. 
if you again join me in prayer, if you begin to Heavenly Father, we come before you today, and we pray for your understanding and prayer with us. Lord, would you give us insight as we study how you grew your church, how you expanded your kingdom? And Lord, would you help us see that we are a part of that great and wonderful fall? I ask to grow and expand to fall, to be glad to prayer, loving one another, to fellowship, to communion. Lord, would you be watching over us and giving us your insight? We started, as we started, the book of Acts this morning. We love you and it's in your son, Jesus' name, that we pray. Amen. The book of Acts. Jesus says to the disciples, the apostles, his closest disciples, his final words that are recorded in the New Testament, with him being there physically present. He said that it's not for you to decide your epoch to the Father takes by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit is set upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. Therefore, I can describe the last thing he said before he ascends back to the throne, set the stage for. The contemporary and really for the history of the church in the present day. The one of the last part of our conversations regarding the future of the United States Church, what God's going to do with us, what He's going to do with our denomination. In fact, this not being no thing, but with conversations always about being like, will the church survive? Will the church grow? Will the church be here for the years from now? If I'm going to concern to talk about that, it's good for us to see where we come from and where we are called to. And so in this end, we're going to spend a bunch of time in the book of Acts, looking at the history of the church and trying to understand our place in it. Now the book of Acts, which is the fifth book in the New Testament, then is unique among New Testament scriptures. It's largely historical. It tells the story of where the church came from. It's also interesting that it's sequel. The Gospel of Luke is the prequel or rather the main story, and Luke picks up right where Luke's Gospel leaves off. That's the first time the only group of believers go from seeing Jesus to Christ, back to the throne, and then it goes on to see the miraculous growth of the early church from just 12 to about 120 people, maybe as many as 500 at most, who saw Jesus resurrected. Many thousands of individual churches being present across the Rome, known Roman world by the end of this book. Although that is largely historical in nature, there's a lot for us to glean from it in our present day, in our present situation. It talks about a lot of things that we still do. It shows the first persecution of Christians with the death of James, the disciple, and Stephen, the martyrdom. It recounts the extended call for followers of Jesus to preach the truth of Christ crucified and resurrected not only to the Jews, but to the Greeks and the Romans and everyone else, the world over. It shows the conversion of God. Perhaps the most important missionary in history, and it gives his ministry, first to the Gentiles and then all the way through his first imprisonment in Rome. But most importantly, this book shows that God's glorious plans are accomplished through the Holy Spirit and through the church, in spite of us being human, in spite of great trouble, and in spite of imperfect followers. If you want to see a theme throughout this book that God has done, if you want to take some of it, which I hope you do, take a song in this book. God's plans for the church continue on. That question of will the church survive? The answer is yes. The church will survive. I hope to have much of those things to take before us is to be faithful and follow that plan no matter what comes our way. 
whether it be persecution or division or trouble. And God willing, hopefully, our working through the early church will be encouraging to you and your continued walk with Christ, even if the end of this is a little bit like the history lesson and as a history teacher, I just love it. So forgive me if I sound more like a teacher instead of a preacher. Speaking of that, this past comes with one of the best things a teacher ever can preach in. Some teachers are aware of other methods, especially if you've got English or history, but the gym is in the frame section. Nothing gets your your number marks from an A to a C fence with a very low transition. Uh, so we can get some A here. He begins with transition. The first thing he says is, the first time I can go, old Theophilus, basically saying, the gospel is new, which I wrote here. Talk about what Jesus began to do in peace. Then we directly link that to the book of Acts. And even though it's written to the same guy, the son of the Atlas, we don't know anything about him, we don't know who he was, what he did, whatever, we just know his name means letter of Acts. But he's the recipient of it. And much like the Gospel of Luke began with, here, O Theophilus is the account of Jesus and his ministry. That begins the same way. O Theophilus, here it is, that's the church began. And it gets right where the Gospel of Luke left off. Jesus, not in the past, not in the And that Jesus starts on you, they will be baptized not with water, but with the Holy Spirit. And the disciples, that being that the kingdom of God be at hand, uh, which is interesting because even today we still ask that question all the time. They told they weren't to know the day of the time. And pause for just a second, though. It's important for us to know that no human knows the day of time when Jesus will come back. We know how he's going to come back. There's a lot of signs about him coming back, but we don't know the day of the time. There's a lot of scientists in the world who say, it's going to be next year. It's going to be in five years. The prophets have spoken it. I don't know. They're learning or they're seeing themselves. But after giving them that message, that first that time, they are going to know the day of the time. His last words before going to his throne in heaven is that they are going to be witnesses to the ends of the earth. They and the people who are called this one. And beloved, I hope you can see that we are part of this great truth that Jesus gives. How many of you were born in the Middle East? Right. How many of you come from Jerusalem or are Jewish? Right. We are the Exodus. We are those people who are as far away as they can possibly imagine. We in the remotest parts of the earth, the remotest people to the earth, those first believers, are proof that God's command comes to be. And the Lord of the Spirit, which began the history on the day of Pentecost, where they received the Holy Spirit, is still a few, and still a lot more, and will continue to be so. The Lord is calling his friends to come to fruition and will continue to be done, in spite of what we as individuals do. The Lord is always in control. And after that prayer, Jesus comes to heaven with the disciples looking on, and after he disappears in the clouds, a couple of individuals come up and talk to the disciples. These are almost certainly angels. And they remind them that Jesus is going to come back in exactly the same way he went. And the apostles said, Leave, and they take out Jesus' instructions to go back to Jerusalem, which is about a day away. Uh, they say a Sabbath day journey away, which is one day for the walking from Jerusalem. Wait for any person. And again, it's good to know that he's come incredibly important in time where they are waiting for this promise. They devote themselves to prayer. Now, in the interim between this and chapter 2, what we didn't read is they find a, a new disciple to take to the Spirit's place. But the real emphasis here is on prayer. 
to part again for a moment, I want you to notice the growth in the church, whether we're talking about a worldwide church, an individual church, or even an individual church, is always accompanied by a prayer. And after a hundred years of prayer, Pentecost comes and many thousands will come to follow Jesus. Let's talk a little bit about prayer. Prayer is important. Despite what you hear in the media right now, with how prayer is the only thing, forget the thoughts and prayers, right? Prayer is important. The culture doesn't recognize it, the world doesn't recognize it, but we as Christians do. And the world is wrong about Jesus, and so they're also wrong about prayer. And we pray for them that they can know Christ. The prayer in its simplest explanation is just coming before the Lord, talking with our Creator, giving Him praise for the good stuff and lifting up the hard stuff to it, praying that His will would be done. By the right way to talk to the Lord, we pray in humility, with intentionally, intentionality, and in seeking His will to be done. Note that it isn't about fancy words or fancy thoughts. You don't have to speak perfect for the Lord to understand you. If we look in perfect humans can understand the pleas of our children, I can understand little I mean, she's not yet to, she speaks in one word sentences, right? And I'm still to figure out what she wants. If I can do that as a bumbling dad, how much easier is it for the Lord to give you the glory and grace to hear our humble prayers? We are called to pray. And we're given the example over and over again in Scripture coming before our Heavenly Father and lifting up in prayer everything that's on our hearts. Jesus said, it, the apostles do it, all the followers of Christ do it in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, the prophets do it, the people do it. And part of the reason we can recognize that all the churches we look here and now, that this church, that's the United Methodist Church, is coming up on 170 years in this area. And because for generations and really for millennia, faithful believers have been in prayer for us, collectively and individually. Thinking of you, Youngsters in our congregation today, and the little ones, we've got a couple of high school kids here too. Have you ever thought about how many people have prayed for you? For those of you who are older, have you ever pondered just how many people have prayed for you? Hundreds? Thousands? People who you've never met? People who were alive long before you were born and prayed that the Lord would reach you? Perhaps millions of people who have already gone on to heaven, and also people who know you if you don't know them. Isn't that true for all of us, beloved? Many, many people have prayed for us. I bring this up because we often question how we can grow the church. Find the church. How can we grow the church? Stay in the church. Where will we be here next year, 10 years from now, 100 years from now? Is the church dying in America? Is it going to go away? Are we going to go away? Well, beloved, we're going to pray and stay alive as God's will. There are an infinite number of books on the whole subject. It seems like every pastor who doesn't want to write the book on how to grow the church, to expand the church, and everyone under the sun is a committee or a program to accomplish those things. Just look at the conference website for our denomination, and there's all sorts of church revitalization programs. Every church has those things. How to sustain it, how to grow it, how to reach young families. That, that's always a big one. But really, we are given a clear example in Acts that comes from the faithful person. A faithful church that is in constant prayer and seeks to do God's will will be well taken care of by the Lord. Moving into Acts chapter 2, we see the official beginning of the church happens 
to thank the Lord and promise to come. Something that accomplishes all the stuff that we really desire for the church to grow and spend. Thanks for that smart, not just to start a church, but also to receive the Holy Spirit. For all of those, all of those who are part of the Lord's universal church, sometimes we call it Catholic with a little thing, all that means is universal. We read from the book on the Catholic form, they were all together in one place, and suddenly the things from heaven and north like a violent rushing wind. They filled the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them times of the fire stripping themselves, and they rested on each one of them. That rested part is important. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Something remarkable happened at Pentecost. And these thoughts, the first of the church received the next Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was simply described, not simply simply, but simply described as God's divine presence in us or the true us. Not that we are divine, we are not, but if you want to think about it in a different way, it's like a uh, wind in, in the sail, or a wrench in the sand, or if we're the gloves, the Lord wears the gloves before the surgery, it's back or something like that. The Holy Spirit doesn't exist before this happens, but it comes in the most. And you have to the Holy Spirit is something that is so forbidden and goes away. Only a very few will ever have it. People are like the prophets, or David, or Moses. Special individuals are filled with the Holy Spirit. And in response, they preach the Lord's word. They do what He called them to do. They describe them different ways. Jeremiah describes it as fire and smoke. Don't resist it. You have to speak the truth. Balaam, thank God, the Lord describes it as something that He did not speak to And the prophet Balaam, who Peter quotes in Acts chapter 2, states that at some point in the future, God will pour out His Spirit on all of His many things. At the end of the Lord, they're going to receive it. It says so they're going to do wonderful things. Marvelous things for the Lord. Jesus, when He says, why He must go away before being crucified, why He must be killed, tells the disciples that in His place He will send the Holy Spirit upon them. John 14, 16, 17 says, I will ask the Father, and He will give you another helper, and he will be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth in the world that has received, because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. What happens on the Peter talks is that everything changes for the church. Instead of God's spirit coming for a bit to one cross that preach the world and the people have to listen or whatever, instead of the Holy Spirit, by Jesus' sacrifice and resurrection, they don't just come and go anymore, but it rests upon God's people, on all those who are His. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon those who are His, great things begin to happen. Everyone is around the disciples when this first occurs. Here is Jesus Christ speaking in several languages, and there are some of them. People all over the world have come to Jerusalem to what's known as the Jewish festival of meat. It was a mission to the Jews again and again. And being from all over, he spoke many languages. And so they're surprised that the Galilean disciples of Jesus are speaking in their own tongue about the mighty deeds of God. And it's so bewildered that they assume the men must be great. Which is very much like the world, isn't it? When something great and mighty happens by the power of the Lord, when somebody is healed of an addiction, when somebody begins to care more about their morality and those around them than themselves, and the world thinks they're crazy. You must go to church, no, you're insane. Here, they're talking about the Lord's mighty deeds and they see the destroyed. Peter's response is the leader of the disciples and the church. Is to take his stand and raise his voice and proclaim what's going on. He says to him, It's something that everyone who comes from the land of the world will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Here comes the truth. Jesus from Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst. 
just as you yourself know, the same delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a place by the means of God was known and put into death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in his power. Therefore, the Lord of the Holy Spirit will know for certain that God is made in both Lord and Christ. Jesus will be crucified. That's the gospel message right here. That's the good news, brother, and the lawful truth. Not just for them, but also for us. The truth is, we have sinners who need a salvation. We need a savior. What is the faith of faith? And many of the people who are listening to Peter, while some stuff, many who are listening, recognize the truth in his message. And don't forget. What must I do? What do I need to do? The king says to them, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and your children and the Lord our God and the name of the Lord our God and the Father himself. Isn't that interesting that he mentions the children? Everybody worries more about the children than the themselves. The little one is worth it. God's promise is to them just to say what he has done. And on that day, when the power of the Holy Spirit is working to his people, the church grows from just a handful of apostles to people thousands. And from that day forward, those believers then go and smoke themselves to the apostles' teachings, that is, scriptures, the truth. The fellowship that is coming together in worship, like we are doing this morning, to the breaking of bread, which is communion, remembrance of what Christ has done for us, and the prayer. And day by day, then, they praise the Lord, and the Lord had a daily to their number, those who were being saved. The love of this message of forgiveness and sins and life eternal is for all who have received the Lord of the Lord. The chosen vessel for the Lord's outreach to the world with the glorious news that we do not have to die in our sins, that there's hope eternal. The chosen vessel is us in the church. Not just your pastor, not just Caleb and Debbie, your missionaries, or those who are really good at talking, like our small group leaders or the folks who are willing to come up and speak. But for us all, all of you have been in the Spirit of God with him, all of you who call Christ Lord. All of us receive the Lord in your lives. All of us who have repented to have been baptized in the name of Jesus receive that wonderful gift. And then what do faithful followers do? They go and share it with others the world over. It's time nobody could have thought, could have imagined just how far the church would have gone. Three thousand people found by the land, but compared it with over a billion in our world who play the Christ. From a small band of individuals to now billions worldwide, the Lord's mercy has been faithfully shared by believers for the land, just as He's commanded us to do. This message of God's grace and forgiveness for all who will respond. Pray for your neighbors, the little and the on the street, the little ones and the old, the criminal and the CEO, the father, the teacher, the mechanic, the nurse, even the politicians, look for them too. Any who repent and follow Christ are forgiven of their sins and given eternal life. The love of God's children here in God's family, it is our duty. Continue to spread the good news far and wide. We too are called to be brothers to to the scriptures, to fellowship, to communion, and to prayer. This is what the Lord's people do. And if you're missing one of those four things, you're missing a big piece of what it means to be a follower of Christ. The young church in Acts gives us a perfect example for how we are to act as this church here now. And we are able to do so because we have received the Holy Spirit. A few words to us. And so, two 
so we might we might switch that because uh, I my my wife needs it and I need it. Uh, my next step is next week. Be in prayer for all of the uh, youngins who are going to be coming with me, and for all those who are going to be up there. Uh, so I'll be here on Father's Day, but then next Monday after we're we're just set up to Painesville for that wonderful time. Uh, there's going to be a church meeting on June 29th regarding all the separation stuff. If you have questions on anything regarding what is what is going on with the United Methodist Church, why is that they keep bringing this up, what are the options, what are the votes, all that sort of stuff, the first meeting is a big overview of all of this. Uh, so if you are able to be there, we invite you to be there. I will set up a Zoom link that can be recorded. We're going to put that that meeting on our Facebook or YouTube page. It's really for uh, those of you who are in our church, not for the community at large in the world. Um, but we want to make sure that everyone participates. So uh, be in prayer and lead up to that. And if you have questions, bring them to that. We will try to answer all the questions. And we will be having monthly meetings between now and May of next year as we talk about this. On a totally different note, uh, there was a fellow, many of you may have seen the article in the newspaper of the fellow who lost his partner to a fire earlier on in the year. Um, he approached the church asking for some assistance, and uh, we've been giving him some help. There are, there are just some needs that come with losing everything you own in fire that uh, are, are going to be shared. There's been a conversation with Sentab and Salvation Army, and now the other churches in the area. Um, but there are some things that, uh, that we can do here in our congregation, too, for him and his three little girls. Uh, so if you are interested in helping this fellow as he recovers from his house fire, some of the things he asked for were clothing, size 36 and 38 pants, shorts, XL shirts, uh, socks, and clothes. Uh, said he was good on a lot of the other clothing. Uh, kitchen stuff, and probably the biggest one, because they'll be out of his apartment for roughly six months, is food. Uh, so non perishable stuff is, is probably the best way to help. And then uh, kids' clothes and kids' clothes for his girls are ages four, seven, and nine. And I don't have specific sizes for them. Uh, but anything that, uh, that you can think about, what we're going to be doing is assembling it together, both from our church and from other churches, or other churches and their members who are giving to them. Uh, we're going to stick it here in the office and then uh, take it all over to the one big lump sum um, as it comes in. So feel free to ask me about questions for that and be in prayer for Roberto and his three girls. That he recovers from that side. Uh, finally, mention this. Membership and baptism were both uh, mentioned in Acts. If you have a desire to be a member of our churches, uh, please let me know. Uh, I've got a couple of folks who are asking already uh, about the next membership class. It's not that bad, right? A few of you have taken your membership classes with me. It's not that bad. It's like a month long. Uh, and then quite a few of you have been baptized too. And uh, if there's anybody who has not been baptized and would like to be baptized, please let me know, and we will uh, welcome you to the church through the Holy Act of Baptism. That's all I've got for us this morning. Go in peace, beloved, and we will see you next week. Oh, there are only some for this, but what do we got? Oh, you're right. Thank you. You did almost get out. We're going to sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you.